Do you ever get the sense that Microsoft are up to something? I mean, there hasn't been any major change to their lineup for a while now, and the refreshes like this new Surface Laptop 5 are pretty minor. I mean, they've ditched AMD CPUs across the lineup. Also, the new Surface Studio 2 Plus is a bit ridiculous for like over four grand and it still comes with 11th gen CPUs, although they have put a 3060 in there. And also the new Surface Pro 9. I haven't had hands-on with it properly yet, but there's two variants of that, an Intel one and an SQ3 one, which is basically a collaboration between Microsoft and Qualcomm. And while there are advantages, particularly to battery life, it is still emulating software. So for most apps, performance isn't as good as if you use the Intel version. But then let's come back to this guy, the Surface Laptop 5, which is still, don't get me wrong, a very nice laptop. I really do like this, but it's barely any different than the Surface Laptop 4, which itself was barely any different from the Surface Laptop 3, which all makes me think Microsoft has to be working on something bigger. My guess is it's their own ARM-based chip, which means they can control hardware and software, just like Apple did with the M1 and the M2. Okay, massive digression over, although I think it's important for context, let's talk about this guy. This is my review of the Laptop 5. And it is a lovely machine with Apple level build quality, a fantastic keyboard and trackpad. It's just that when it comes to performance and battery life, right now there's no Windows laptop that can really catch the similarly priced M1 or M2 MacBook Air. So the question is, is this a good alternative to the MacBook Air or something like the Dell XPS 13? Or has dropping the Ryzen CPU option and reusing the same design again with its fairly limited ports I mean it's tough to recommend. I mean as Windows machines go this is a pretty refined device and if you are just using it to browse the web, watch Netflix, do some office work, maybe a bit of Lightroom editing, you really can't go wrong. Now once again there are two options, you've got the 13.5 inch which I have here and it's bigger brother the 15. What is new this year is we have Intel's 12th generation i5 and i7 CPUs, although only the i7 on the 15 inch, as well as faster DDR5X RAM and finally Thunderbolt 4. We also get this new sage green color which is quite nice, as well as platinum, sandstone, black and alcantara which carried over from the laptop 4 and each color even gets their own matching windows wallpaper which is nice I guess. And that is it. New chip, Thunderbolt 4, new color. Not the most exciting upgrade. And it is a shame that Microsoft chose to drop the AMD CPU option as Ryzen chips had been the better choice for more demanding multi-threaded apps and also for longer battery life last time around. Now with this guy, I get around 10 hours of light use with a screen set to about half brightness, which is around 200 nits, and closer to 11 hours in my full screen video test. That's not bad at all, it's actually very good, but it's still less than most people were getting with last year's Ryzen based Laptop 4 in similar tests. And pretty much everything else is carried over from the Laptop 4. We've got the same 3x2 pixel sense screen, which is a very nice screen, and I do appreciate it's a touch screen, which of course you don't get on the Macs, uh, but we do have these fairly chunky bezels, the webcam's not really been improved, it's still 720p, and well the design hasn't changed at all, but come on, this is still gorgeous. Even closing it just then, listen to this. Just sounds premium. I also have absolutely no complaints about build quality. There isn't a creak or a wobble or anything out of place and the screen even gets Gorilla Glass 5 so it's a little bit more durable. The screen will be a bit divisive though. Not everyone loves 3x2 and personally I think 16x10 is the sweet spot. So basically this is a bit squarer and a little bit taller than most screens that you'll probably be used to and also of course if you're watching videos and movies you're gonna have thicker black bars. Also, while the image quality is good, it's no match for OLED alternatives like we get on Asus's VivoBooks or more expensive Dell XPS's. And of course, being stuck at 60Hz, unlike the Surface Pro models, kind of bottlenecks just how smooth the performance feels anyway. I think overall the screen is a good fit for the base models, but definitely not in the £1,700 top spec form. Brightness is also pretty average, we get around 380 to 400 nits, although we do have Dolby Vision IQ support, which is great if you're watching something on Netflix that supports Dolby Vision, but the lack of basic HDR10 means there's actually no HDR option in Windows or YouTube, but then that 400 nit brightness wouldn't give you a particularly good HDR experience anyway. But overall it is still a very nice screen and for most work and movies and maybe some basic gaming it's absolutely fine but if your projects are more color sensitive I would probably look elsewhere because while the 100% sRGB coverage is good the 67% Adobe RGB and 69% P3 is pretty average. Although at 1.3 kilograms for this 13.5 inch model it's a smidge heavier than the MacBook Air and also a fair bit thicker actually so it's not the thinnest or the lightest but you could easily carry it around all day. There's this classy mirrored windows logo on the lid, we get these nice rounded corners and angled edges that keeps everything feeling slim, and as for ports, well there aren't really an awful lot of them. We have the surface connector charger on this side, that is all you have on the 
right side as you're looking at it. On the other side, we have a full-size USB-A, a, a USB-C Thunderbolt 4, which is very good to see, and also a headphone jack. But the good news is that Thunderbolt 4 port means that you now have a ton of other options for hubs and connectivity, and also means you don't have to rely on Microsoft's overpriced Surface Dock 2, which attaches via the Surface Connect port. There's still no Wi-Fi 6E, but it's not the end of the world. One of the best things about the Surface Laptop 5, and really any Surface device, is the keyboard. This is still one of the best keyboards, for me at least, on any Windows laptop. There's good feedback, it's not too clacky, and my fingers always found the right key. There isn't a ton of travel, but this is still a great keyboard. And as for the touchpad, it could be a little bit bigger, but feedback is nice, it's responsive, and it's accurate. I also think maybe I could have forgiven these fairly chunky bezels for a 2022 laptop if they'd improved the webcam, if there was a really beefy, high-quality webcam in here. Well, it's still 720p, no change there, although they say they have improved the image quality, the processing, uh, so let me know what you think in the comments. I think it's doing a pretty good job. If I change the uh, lighting conditions a little bit, you can see how it copes. We also get dual far-field microphones, and I am impressed, actually, how good the microphone quality sounds on this webcam. And of course, also, we get uh, an IR sensor for Windows Hello face unlocking. Now, considering the only real upgrade with this of any significance is that jump to 12th gen Intel processors. The question is, how fast is it? Well, performance in everyday apps is totally fine. Even editing the old photo and playing some less demanding games is no problem. And impressively, even in the top spec form with the i7, the fans only come in under serious load. And even then, they're still pretty quiet with temperatures sitting around the mid 80s. And the chassis stayed nice and cool, even under moderate load. I did try a little bit of video editing, and while it's fine for basic 1080p projects, if you have a lot of assets or you're editing with 4K, you'll probably want something with a bit more grunt. Also, the Iris XE integrated graphics got me just over 50 FPS in Rainbow Six Siege, albeit on low settings, and around 60 in Overwatch 2, so they're both just about playable. As for the speakers, they're okay. They can be a bit tinny sometimes, but these Omnisonic speakers do support Dolby Atmos. So if you are watching something that does support Atmos, I did find the surround sound was actually quite good, but regular videos, it's a little bit tinny. Even so, voices are clear and they can get loud enough for watching movies if you're sat close by, but of course a pair of headphones will always be better, and you do have this 3.5mm jack if you prefer. So, how much? Well, the 13.5 here starts at 999 here in the UK, with the 15-inch model uh, starting at 1299, 300 pounds more for the bigger model. Now, if you don't mind the Alcantara keyboard and can live with 256 gigs of storage, then I would just go with the base 13.5-inch model. As at about 1,000 pounds, same in dollars, it's easily the best value. But the trouble is, if you want it to feel like a proper premium laptop, then you'll need to drop an extra 250 or so to get one of the color metal finishes, along with 512 storage. So that's probably the overall sweet spot for me. And at this price, I think it's still a decent buy, but if you go any higher, I don't think the value argument is anything like as strong. However, you may also want to consider one of these. This is the Dell XPS 13, and the base entry-level spec is about a grand and gives you pretty much identical specs to this, but with 512 storage, we also get an extra Thunderbolt port. It's a little bit thinner, it's a little bit lighter. Yes, it misses on the touchscreen in this base spec, but for my money, I reckon the Dell's a better choice. And of course, don't forget, we also have the M1 and M2 MacBook Airs to consider, both of which are thinner and will probably give you a better battery life and performance, but obviously without the touchscreen support. What I think I would do, if you are really considering the Laptop 5, because you want Windows, you want a nice Ultrabook laptop, and perhaps for whatever reason you don't want the Dell XPS, I would consider last year's Laptop 4. It's pretty much just as good, and you could probably get it for one to 200 pounds less. But what do you think? Tempted by one of these, or do you think Microsoft's just got a little bit lazy? If you do have any questions about this, and I don't know why I'm holding the box and actually not the laptop itself, let me know in the comments as well. I'll do my best to answer them. And if you enjoyed this review, then a cheeky like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, guys. And I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat.